Dispute Resolution There is perhaps a tendency when studying an academic law degree to think solely of contracts as legal matters, where in the case of a dispute, the immediate answer is to go to court and get a judgment. And while in some cases a court may be the only, or indeed best, way to get a dispute resolved, it's far from the only way. In this podcast, I'm going to talk about different aspects of dispute resolution, including how you might try to avoid disputes in the first place, as well as considering some alternatives to litigation. If you are looking for hard law and cases and statutes, then this is probably not the podcast for you, but hopefully it will get you thinking about dispute resolution and potentially influence the way you think about contracts. The starting point is that ideally you want to avoid getting into a dispute in the first place. And in terms of contract issues, trying to enter into deals which are beneficial to both parties might be a good way of bringing this about. There is perhaps a tendency, uh, particularly amongst lawyers, to approach negotiation as something akin to driving a steamroller, with the idea that you will smash down your opposition to get the best bargain you can get for yourself. Ask yourself this, is that, generally, going to get you a good deal? If you are envisaging a long-term relationship with someone, would you not be better off ensuring that the deal is mutually beneficial, and that both parties have an incentive, a desire, to continue to perform and to continue to trade, rather than constantly feeling that they've been coerced into something which really is not in their interests? In this regard, I would highly recommend taking a look at the book Getting to Yes. It's a book aimed at reaching agreements which meet the objectives of both parties, and it's one of the classic negotiation skills treaties. I'm sure that there are other resources which you might use too, but for me, this has been a particularly useful book. Second, having an escalation clause can put the brakes on what might be an increasingly hostile situation, and force a re-evaluation of what is happening. Similarly, if you're someone in a large organisation, it can be easy to ca get caught up in the minutiae of an arrangement and fail to see the bigger picture. Perhaps, if you are able to take a step back and someone less closely connected with the day-to-day -day involvement of a relationship were to take a look, it might not seem so bad after all, and what to you might seem like a very big issue might, in the grand scheme of things, be a small bump which can be easily overcome. You will often see escalation clauses in agreements, setting out that if um, the parties come across something on which they're not able to agree, first the dispute goes to more senior managers within the organisation, and then finally, perhaps, to the legal directors of each organisation before a party can have recourse to litigation. The aim being to try and find a sensible commercial way of solving issues rather than simply resorting to the courts. Conversely, an overly cumbersome or convoluted escalation procedure may unduly delay the resolution of a dispute and may prevent you from filing a claim before a court unless in, or until you have exhausted the contractual procedure. There's a balancing act to be had here. Again, perhaps a tendency in particular of lawyers, it might be tempting to jump quickly once a dispute arises to telling the other side, but the law says, and making clear what your legal rights are. There may be a time and a place for this, and in some situations, gently pointing out that, frankly, the other side's being a bit silly, might just get you where you want to be. But I would question whether, as a rule of thumb, it is a wise place to start if you're generally trying to resolve a dispute in a way which keeps the relationship going. Think about how you might resolve a dispute in everyday life. For example, something that you've bought from a shop which turns out to be faulty. In the first place, I should have thought that you're likely to take it back and ask politely for what you're expecting. Perhaps your money back or a replacement item or a repair. You're probably unlikely to walk in, walk straight up to the cashier and say, pursuant to a contract of 31st of July, and in consideration of my payment of £100, by virtue of 14.3 of the sale of Goods Act 79, there is an implied term, and so on. You might do it, but it would seem unusual. And in fact, it's probably going to get you a worse reaction, less likely to achieve your outcomes, than simply being polite and friendly. My experience is that going in at the beginning, going as a lawyer, probably closes off more avenues for resolution than it opens, and many people are immediately 
put off. Although strictly outside the scope of contract law, I was impressed recently by a letter written by a US law professor, Chris Brigman, in response to a cease and desist demand from singer Katy Perry's lawyers about a 3D printer model of a character uh, who appeared and dancing behind her at, at a concert. Um, I've included a link to the letter in the notes and I would suggest that you take a look. To me, it does a great job of getting its point across in a relaxed, friendly manner, which is probably more conducive of getting a settlement than a prolonged fight from a feisty lawyer. Um, contrast this from the original cease and desist letter itself, which is probably more what you would expect a lawyer's letter to look like. Another factor con to consider is that litigation is often expensive and usually uncertain. When you read the cases, unless there is a specific provision in the judgment about the quantum of fees, chances are you'll not get much of an insight into the costs incurred by both parties in getting to a judgment. Tens, perhaps hundreds of thousands of pounds of legal fees, all coming out of your revenue. You might be fortunate enough to recover some of this if you win your case, but is that a gamble you're willing to take, particularly since if you lose, on top of your own legal fees, you may have to pay some or all of your opponent's legal fees too. You may have access to courts which attempt to minimise the potential cost risks associated with the litigation to enable parties to bring usually relatively small claims without fearing that they may have to pay massive legal fees to the other side if they lose. In the UK, there is a specific track of the county court, the small claims track, which exists to resolve small claims up to a few thousand pounds, and which does not permit a winner to recover from the loser legal fees, although other expenses such as travel costs, postage costs and so on are recoverable. I have included a link to a guide to litigating in the small claims court aimed at people who would be taking action without having professional legal advice, and it's worth having a look through it. Litigation is not the only option for resolving disputes, and I'm going to talk briefly about four other options. Mediation, arbitration, alternative dispute resolution, and online dispute resolution. In mediation, the parties make use of an independent and impartial third party to try and find an outcome which is acceptable to both parties. By default, mediation is not binding, although it may be possible for parties to enter a contract that they will cooperate with the mediation process and will abide by its outcome. Even this does not make mediation quite legally binding, but it does provide a breach of contract claim in the event that the party does not comply with its obligations. A party can decide not to continue with mediation, or to reject its outcome and proceed with the litigation unless they have agreed otherwise. The aim of mediation is usually to find a way forward which works for the parties, rather than trying to allocate blame or responsibility for something which has gone wrong in the past. In arbitration, the parties submit the dispute to an independent third party, which may be an individual or a panel of individuals, who will consider each side's case and come up with a decision. It may not be a cheap option, but as arbitration can be conducted in confidence, it can avoid the public scrutiny which litigation before the courts could entail. The Arbitration Act of 1996 sets out the legal framework for arbitration in the United Kingdom, but it is not the only model. You might like to take a look at the 1985 Unicitral Model Law in International Commercial Arbitration, which is designed to establish a framework for international commercial arbitration. In terms of ADR, specifically in the telecommunications context, Article 84B of the Framework Directive requires that national regulatory authorities must ensure the availability of simple and inexpensive dispute resolution procedures carried out by a body that's independent of the parties involved. In the United Kingdom, communications providers offering services to individuals and small businesses, those with up to 10 employees, must be members of an alternative dispute resolution scheme. Annex 4 to the general condition contains more information on the requirements of providers in terms of ensuring that customers are aware of their right to use ADR. For a provider, ADR can actually be more expensive than a small claims court case, since it is the provider who pays for the costs of ADR, 
even if the decision ends up being in their favour. Ofcom conducted a review of ADR in 2012, and I have included a link to the page on its website in the notes where you can download and read a copy of the review. An area of increasing focus is that of online dispute resolution. This refers to the use of online bodies, whether courts or something less formal, to resolve problems rather than recourse to more traditional, generally far more offline, courts. An example of the less formal, non-judicial approach to online dispute resolution is eBay, which is often held out as a prime example of a system which resolves disputes quickly and easily. Buyers and sellers on the platform can use the resolution centre when they have problems with their transaction, for buyers when an item is not received or it's significantly not as described, or for sellers when a buyer, when a buyer does not pay. eBay emphasises, of course, that parties should try to resolve the disputes first before going through the resolution centre. Outside the scope of eBay or any particular service, the Civil Justice Council in the UK published a report on online dispute resolution in February 2015, and I have included a link to this in the notes. The report calls strongly for the introduction of formalised ODR into the court system as an alternative to, or a replacement for, traditional in-person claims. It would be particularly useful in the case of small claims, and the report's focus is on civil claims under the value of £25,000, but the report's authors consider that the system could be used for other claims too. The leading author of the report was Professor Richard Suskind, and here's a short video of him talking about the proposals. Welcome to the website of the Online Dispute Resolution Advisory Group of the Civil Justice Council. We were given the task of thinking about how technology might be used in low-value civil claims. And so we looked at the whole field of online dispute resolution, and we were conscious of low-value civil claims that currently, if you go through the conventional court system, for most people, and particularly litigants in person, it's too costly, it's too complex, it's quite slow. And so how can technology help? Well, we've come up with an idea of using technology really in two fundamentally new ways. First of all, the idea of judges deciding cases online. So this will be senior judges from our system looking at cases on the papers or perhaps sometimes using telephone conferencing calls and at a later stage perhaps video calls, but essentially judges dealing with cases on an online basis. That's one innovation. The second idea we've had is to introduce a new category of individual, what we call the online facilitator. And in the spirit of early dispute resolution or alternative dispute resolution, these are individuals who will look at claims and bring the parties together, negotiate a little, perhaps act as mediators, offer some kind of guidance, but somehow act as a filter so that cases that don't really need judicial attention don't go through to the online judges. And our conclusion in all of this is if we use technologies, ODR, by which we're really meaning the use of technology to solve disputes or sort out problems, legal problems that individuals have, this kind of technology will do two things. Firstly, it will increase access to justice because we believe more people will use the system. It'll be cheaper, it'll be more convenient, less forbidding. And secondly, and I've mentioned this, but it'll lower the costs. But it's not just the cost to individual participants in disputes, also the cost of the overall justice system. We hope you join us in being enthusiastic about the potential of ODR for civil justice claims. Thank you. The report proposes, as Professor Suskin said, a three-tiered internet-based court service, Her Majesty's Online Court. Tier 1 for online evaluation would be a tool to help parties to a potential dispute understand their rights and obligations and the options and remedies available to them to try and narrow down what might be in dispute. Tier 2, online facilitation, is a mediation service where the parties in dispute submit electronic materials which real people review, coupled with some automated, automated negotiation systems. Tier 3, online judges, is what you might consider the real online court, in which judges review disputes based on electronic submissions and reach a decision, just as they would if sitting in a physical court. 
Given the track record for IT projects in the public sector in the UK, one might question whether the uh, report's projected costs, a tiny fraction of the court service's £75 million annual budget allocated for reform, are realistic. And the report acknowledges that it is not yet possible to present a fully articulated business case for the project. However, personally, I'm optimistic that making courts accessible online could open the doors to a greatly increased access to justice. At the same time, we need to be mindful that not everyone is literate in using a computer, and forcing them to use one to defend their rights, or to make a claim, could actually exclude some from obtaining justice. A fundamental question, if this project does go ahead, will be for how long should traditional courts remain available. The online dispute resolution video featuring Professor Richard Suskind is available from the judiciary.gov.uk website and is licensed under the Open Government Licence.